Did you feel that? Something just happened that many of us take for granted. Another year is officially in the past. A chapter is closed. And now we look ahead to a new year. The mistakes, missteps, and missed opportunities of the past give way to hope, excitement, and joy for the new life God gives us. Pursuing Christ with each new dawn. Through His grace, we get the chance to reset the clock, to forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. As we work, play, rest, and worship, we know His mercies are new every morning. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, arriving at next year's end through His faithfulness. So whatever we do this year, let's give it to God seeking His will, trusting His plan, and taking this opportunity to restart. Morning, church. We are in this restart series, week two. And uh, I don't know about you, but I love that concept of restart. Anybody like a new beginning? Getting to start over, start things fresh. And there's just something special about the new year. And there's something special about starting the new year in God's house. Amen. Just starting it with putting him first, spending time in his presence, and prioritizing the things that matter. And so I'm excited to be back here today with you guys. It was so fun to go up to Wisconsin last Sunday. Got to fulfill a lifelong dream and attend a Packer game at Lambeau Field. And uh, if you didn't grow up in Wisconsin like me, maybe you can't relate. Iowa doesn't have a pro sports team. And uh, I'm just telling you, it was, it was awesome. It was a dream come true. And I just want to shout out my, my beautiful but uh, powerful preacher wife for holding it down both at home and here at the church last Sunday while I was gone to make that possible. And so aren't you guys grateful for Pastor Megan Church? Yeah. Amen. She's awesome. And my adorably pregnant daughter for leading us in worship as Courtney and family were also gone on vacation. So grateful for the entire team that we have here. If you missed last week's message, uh, it was powerful. It was on uh, the story of Rahab. And, and really in this series, what we're doing is we're talking about biblical stories of turnaround. And uh, you can relate to the characters in the Bible, like Rahab, even though she's a prostitute. Maybe you don't find yourself in that place, but you know what? There was a turnaround in her life that we can all find relatable. And today we're going to talk about another turnaround story. We're going to talk about the, the King Hezekiah of the Old Testament. And I believe there are aspects of his life as well that you might not be a king, but you can still relate to the turnaround story of King Hezekiah. And so I don't know about you, but when uh, Jesus found me, he needed to turn me around. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, we all, if we're in Christ, we all should be able to look back and say, yes, I needed to turn around. But more than that, today still, you still need to turn around. <laughs> You still need a comeback story. God still wants to take you to a new level in him, and he's not finished working in your life. Can I get an amen? amen. Some of y'all are awake this morning. Praise God. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at the life of Hezekiah. He became king over Judah at the age of 25. I don't know about you, but uh, if I became king over anything at the age of 25, I probably would have drove that thing into the ground. Uh, people would have really regretted putting me in that position at 25. And, uh, but here he was at 25 years old, the king of Judah, and he reigned for 29 years. And even though he'd been born to Ahaz, who was an ungodly king, scripture tells us that Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Can I tell you that obedience matters? When we obey the Lord, when we do what he says, his hand of blessing is upon that. We can't just live any old way we want to and expect God to bless it because he don't bless no mess. Amen? He's looking, to, he's looking to bless some obedient children. He's looking to bless some people whose hearts are submitted to him, and that's the kind of king that Hezekiah was. He destroyed the idols of his day. He tore down pagan altars, pagan temples. How I many know we need to tear down some pagan altars and temples in our world today? Yeah, there's some things, there's some, there's some ungodly worship that's happening in our culture today, and we can't just, just walk through life oblivious to those things. God's called us to destroy the works of Satan. God has called us to pull down some strongholds in our world today. He's called us to tear down some altars and some pagan temples, amen? 
There's spiritual warfare happening all around us, and God wants us to be actively involved in that. And so Hezekiah, yes, he was a king in the natural sense, and so he was royalty. He operated in authority, but we have authority today too in Christ Jesus. You are royalty today in Christ Jesus, and we need to walk in that authority and we need to tear down some things, and we need to realize that wherever you live, if you live in Rhinebeck today, can I tell you that this is your town and these are your people? If you live in, in Dyke, that's your town and those are your people. If you live in Lapore, that's your town, those are your people. Eldora, same, same thing goes. Because wherever you set your foot, you claim that territory for the kingdom of God. And we take ownership over that area. And so Hezekiah, he took ownership over his land and the godly mandate that was upon his life. We carry a godly mandate upon our lives, and we need to walk in the authority that is ours, and we need to take responsibility for the people and the territory that God has called us to. Amen? And so Hezekiah was an awesome king, and his, his reign was marked by riches, good health, and protection, because as king of Judah, again, he obeyed the commands of the Lord. You see, obedience didn't just bless Hezekiah's life. When, when Hezekiah led in such a way that he was righteous and obedient to the Lord, it blessed the people that he was leading as well. When you obey the Lord, it blesses not just you. It blesses your household. It blesses your children and your children's children. And so as we submit our ways to the Lord, I'm telling you, it hands down a legacy that goes on from generation to generation. It affects your coworkers. It affects your neighbors. It affects your community. Obedience is not just some legalistic thing, following the rules. It's about aligning our hearts with the heart of Jesus, so that what he wants to pour out can be poured through you and me, that we can be a vessel that's aligned with his will to pour his love out to the people around us. And so here Hezekiah, he reopened the temple of Solomon. He ushered in a season of revival that led the people back into relationship with the one true God. His father had established a completely different legacy. God was all but forgotten under King Ahaz. But Hezekiah stepped on the scene and he said, no, we're not going to lead that way. I'm going to prioritize Yahweh. I'm going to lead the people to the only source of true life. Hezekiah realized that's not me. I'm not the source of life, but I can point you to the one who is. Today, I can tell you this, that there's a lot of people who are desperate in our world today. I feel that I don't know how many phone calls even just this past week from people who were struggling, people who were desperate, people who were feeling like the forces of darkness were opposing them. And I'm not pointing them to myself. I'm not pointing them to any human source. I'm pointing them to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that he is our source of life, that no matter how dark your situation is, there is always the light of Christ that can be shined into your situation. There is hope no matter what you're facing today. Amen. And Hezekiah understood that. And so leading people into a right relationship with God was his ultimate priority. Because it didn't matter how good his leadership was, he knew if God isn't seated on his throne, if he isn't given his rightful place, then there's only so much I can do. I'm limited in my own ability. If I want the people to be blessed, if I want the land to be blessed, then I need to make sure that I am pointing them to the king of kings. And so God fought on Judah's behalf against the Assyrians, sending an angel to strike down 185,000 of their soldiers and to deliver them from their siege. How many know when, when an angel of the Lord shows up and destroys 185,000 soldiers, word gets out, don't mess with those people. God's on their side. The God of angel armies is with them. And see, I think a lot of times in this life, we struggle and we strive and we fight in the flesh and we use weapons of the flesh to try to win battles that can only be won in heavenly places. And Hezekiah understood that, hey, I, I don't have that much power, but when I put the Lord first, when I cry out to him in the midst of my hardship, he will send an answer, he will send a deliverance, he will intervene on my behalf and he'll do it in such a way that there's no, there's no logical, no earthly, no human explanation for it. But that kind of victory, slaying 185,000 soldiers that way, that's something that, that people are going to talk about. But hear me, it's not for Hezekiah's glory. It's for God's glory. It's not for Hezekiah's renown. It's for the renown of our master and our savior. When God comes through victorious in your life, it's to bring glory and honor to his name. That's what it's for. 
So we don't shrink back when the enemy presses against us. We, we run towards the battle line. Why? Because we know our God fights for us. Because we know this isn't just an obstacle. This is an opportunity for God to demonstrate his glory and for us to have a testimony to share of what God has done. Amen? Amen. So 185,000 soldiers and, and, and the people of God were delivered from the Assyrian siege. And then in accordance with the word given by God through the prophet Isaiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, would return home where he'd be killed by his very own sons, where he worshipped in the temple of his God with a little g. So there he is. He's the leader of this army who's just been destroyed. He returns home. His very sons take his life as he's worshiping at his pagan altar. I hear that story and I just go, oh my goodness. Not only did the angel of the Lord intervene on behalf of Hezekiah and the people of God, but then when the enemy, you got to realize this represents the enemy. I'm telling you that when the enemy comes against your life, not only is God going to intervene and provide a miracle, but I'm telling you the enemy is going to go running with his tail tucked between his legs. There's going to be a defeat that's brought not just to his kingdom, but to him himself. And he's going to know better than to mess with you again. Amen? I'm telling you that when the Lord shows up in your life, it's not just a temporal for, for this moment deliverance. It's to take you to a place where you're able to then look back and say, look at what my God did. And if he did it then, he can do it again. And if he did it for them, he can do it for me. And I'm telling you that this is the year that the Lord wants us to press in and to advance, to go forward courageously in the Lord. And so maybe 2022, you can look back and you can see some defeats. You can see some areas where you were not walking in victory. I tell you, this is going to be a year, I believe this, where you're going to press into the presence of the Lord. You're going to prioritize the, the ways of the Lord in your life through obedience and righteousness. And you're going to see the hand of the Lord moving upon your life like never before, leading you into victory for his namesake, for his renown, for his glory. Amen. And so this was Hezekiah, though. He, he had one heck of a resume. I mean, you look at this, and this, this guy was a man of God. He lived reverently before the Lord. He ruled righteously over the people of the Lord. And he was renowned throughout the region as somebody that nobody wanted to mess with because the, the Lord of the angel armies was on his side. And in fact, in 2 Chronicles 32, it tells us that he succeeded in everything that he did. Wouldn't you like that to be said of you? You succeeded in everything that you did. I mean, that cannot be said of very many people, but it was said of Hezekiah. To say things were going well for him, that'd be an understatement, right? He was on a massive winning streak, and then suddenly we come to this place in his story where something strange happens that seems to stop all of Hezekiah's positive momentum. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 20. We'll have it on the screen. It interrupts the narrative that we're seeing here. This, this winning streak, this, this concept of a king who is so unstoppable. He's got full steam ahead, moving in the direction of victory. There's nobody who can stand against him. And then in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 20, about that time, right on the heels of all of these victories, right on the heels of all of his wins, about that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to visit him. He gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you're going to die. You will not recover from this illness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that you're in the house. We thank you, God, for your promises that are true. They are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. God, we build our lives upon your word, upon your promises. And God, we live for your renown. We live for your glory to be made known. God, as we receive from what you have for us today, God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me. God, I pray that you would speak to every heart and every mind. God, I pray that every life in this place would, would have a turnaround because of what you're going to deposit in our our lives, in our spirits, in these next few moments. God, we ask for your anointing to do what only you can do. God, we ask for your supernatural intervention. God, right here in this room, right here in our hearts, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Hezekiah, he falls ill, and the man of God, Isaiah, shows up at his house. Can you imagine if you send me a text, you send me an email, Pastor, I'm sick. Pastor, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in bad shape. And he's, can you come visit me? I show up at your house. I don't, I don't come with medicine. 
I don't come to pray for your healing. No, I come and I say, you're about to die, thus saith the Lord. I mean, no, that's a bad day. That's a bad day. My bedside manner probably wouldn't be very good at that point if that's the message I'm delivering. You, you, can you get somebody else in here? Can you send Pastor Jared down here? Because <laughs> I need somebody to speak life over me today. Well, that's the experience that Hezekiah is having. The man of God shows up and he speaks death. And it's thus saith the Lord. This is the prophet Isaiah talking. This isn't just some, some chump off the street who doesn't know what he's talking about. This is the prophet Isaiah. This is a man of God. And he's speaking by the authority of the Lord. This is from God. And he says, you're going to die. You're not going to recover. And so here's one of the first things we need to learn from the life of Hezekiah. A righteous man whose life was marked by the favor of God is this, that even if you're doing right, things still may not go right. We don't like this truth, though, do we? We, we don't. If we're going to make a formula, it's not going to be this one, right? Right? We like the formula that says, when I do right, things go right. When I do good, I get good. And if somebody has bad, they must have done bad. Yeah. We like that formula because it makes more sense to us. Yeah. But the reality is, like Hezekiah, you can be doing all the right things. You can have God prioritize in your life. You can be tearing down enemy strongholds. You can make sure that you're pointing people to Jesus. You're obeying the word of God. You're living righteously. And you're doing right yet still for all of us, there comes a point when the ground underneath us just falls right out, when something just suddenly interrupts our story, interrupts our winning streak, and it feels like, man, it just knocked the wind right out of me. And we're left with more questions than answers, and we struggle to wrap our heads around, how could this be? We don't like this idea, but it's true. The longer you live, the more you realize this, this truth that you can be doing all the right things and still things may not go right. That diagnosis from the doctor, that disappointing news from a family member, that call in the middle of the night from your son or your daughter, the divorce that blindsided you and left you devastated, the heartbreaking death of a loved one that you could have never prepared yourself for. And you're left with this nagging question, what did I do to deserve this? Have you ever found yourself there, in that place where you're asking that question? What did I do to deserve this? Why do we ask that? Because we believe that if we do things right, that things will go right. That's why we ask that question, because it doesn't fit with our paradigm. It doesn't fit with our formula. You know, maybe if you're Rahab the prostitute who we talked about last week, maybe if you've got her resume, you don't reach this conclusion because you realize, I don't deserve anything good. <laughs> Maybe that's, you, you identify more with her because you're, you're in that place where you say, I, I'm a worthless sinner. I, I, I don't deserve any good thing. It doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter how, how I've turned around my life. I, I'm telling you that because of all that I've done, I don't deserve a single good thing in my life. And maybe you can identify more with her. But if you're like Hezekiah, can I tell you the inherent danger is that on your best days, you took the credit. So now on your worst days, you're going to need somebody to blame. We've got to be careful, friends, that when we, when we create a theology that says, when I do right, things go right, and when I don't do right, things don't go right, then we walk in, in this dangerous place of taking all the credit when things go well and taking all the blame when things don't. And all of a sudden, our faith isn't in the goodness of God anymore. Our faith is in our situation and our circumstances, and there's too many people living this life today, too many Christians walking around this world who base their evaluation on God, of God's love on their circumstances instead of looking at their circumstances through the lens of God's love. God cares about you even in your lowest moment. God cares about you even in your greatest failure. God cares about you even when that doctor has given you a diagnosis of death. God cares about you in every situation and circumstance of life. And when things don't go right, don't just jump to the conclusion that you must have done something wrong. Hezekiah wasn't doing anything wrong here, yet things didn't go right for him. Be careful the formulas that you create. Eventually, the ground will fall out beneath every one of us, sooner or later. In a prideful heart, it's going to end up bitter and resenting God when things don't go the way that we think they should. 
I've seen too many people walk away from God because of their circumstances. Too many people walk away from God bitter and resentful because they thought, if, if I just do the right things, everything's going to go right for me. If I just say that prayer, then, then following Jesus is going to be so easy, it's going to be a tiptoe through the tulips. And I'm telling you that following Jesus, your life doesn't get easier. It gets better, but it doesn't get easier. If anything, it gets harder because now the enemy's got you in his crosshairs. He's going to oppose you at every turn. Now, we don't need to fear. We don't need to shrink back. As I said earlier, we can be filled with faith, filled with courage, filled with hope today. We can take territory, but I'm telling you, your life in Christ, it doesn't become easier. It does become better, but the enemy is going to oppose. And so we must not fall into this trap of giving ourselves credit when things go well and giving ourselves blame when things don't. The enemy can use that kind of theology. Bad things still happen to good people. And while that may cause some people to feel like giving up and throwing in the towel, can I tell you that when you discover that God isn't just good on the good days, but you discover that he's good every moment of every day, then when things fall apart, you know where you're going to find yourself? You're going to find yourself falling into the arms of God, and that's the very best place you can be. Sometimes rock bottom is the best place a person can find themselves. And moms and dads, listen, you need to hear this. Sometimes the worst thing we can do is cushion our kids' fall. Because if, if rock bottom doesn't hurt a little bit, they're not going to turn to Jesus. They're not going to turn and say, I can't do this anymore. I'm done with, with feeling the pain of hitting rock bottom. But if I don't feel the pain, then I don't need to turn to the Savior. I don't need to turn to the healer. I don't need to turn to the deliverer because it wasn't that bad. I can, I can pick myself up out of that situation. I can, I can fix myself. I can endure that pain because it didn't hurt that much. Sometimes the best thing we can do is let somebody fall so that they can fall into the arms of Jesus. And that's the very best place that they can be. Sometimes we forget that rock bottom was the place where we found Jesus. I don't resent my rock bottom. I'm grateful to God for my rock bottom because that was the place of introduction. Amen? That place where I said I'm about to end it all. That place where I said I'm, I'm so sick of being addicted. That place where I had no hope. That was where I found Jesus. So I don't resent that. I don't resent that. And I won't stop somebody else from, from going to that place of introduction to Jesus. He's good. He's good every moment of every day, not just on the good days. You see, adversity can have its advantages when it drives us to deeper dependency on the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Adversity can have its advantages. We cannot resist the hard things. We cannot resist adversity when it comes knocking because it has its advantages. And I'm telling you that if you came through 2022 and it was a year of adversity for you, I want you to look at it differently as you start out your 2023. Look at it as an opportunity. Look at it. Look at that adversity as an advantage because it's pushing you. It's driving you into a place of deeper dependency on the Lord that you've now realized I can't do it in my own strength. And that's the place I had to come to to finally depend on his. And that's what I really need. Let's continue in the, in the text here, 2 Kings 20 and verse 2. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. And then he broke down and wept bitterly. Listen, the word of God makes it really clear that, that he succeeded, Hezekiah succeeded in all the things that he did. The word of God makes it really clear that Hezekiah was a righteous king. So I am not in any way casting dispersions on King Hezekiah. He is a greater man than I could ever be. But I'm going to tell you what, as I read this prayer, and I think about what that must have sounded like to the Lord, I detect that there was probably some pride there. I detect that there's a little bit of pounding my own chest there. Look at what a great man of God I am, and look who he's talking to. Can I tell you that when you come before the Holy One, the one we sang about this morning, and you come before him pounding your chest and, and, and reading your resume in any way, shape, or form, you're probably missing it. Because when we compare ourselves to each other, we can do that. But when we compare ourselves to the Holy One, you can't. You can't. 
There, there is nothing that you're going to be able to brag on. You're going to look at the Holy One and you're going to realize just how unholy you are. The closer you get to him, the more you realize how sinful you are. And, and Hezekiah would be no exception. The closer he gets to the Holy One, there's going to be a light that is shined in his darkness that reveals some things that he didn't even know was there. there in our lives, friends, sin isn't just the conscious decisions that we make to rebel against God. I'm telling you, as a pastor, the closer I get to the presence of God, this is why 21 days of prayer and fasting is so incredibly important because the closer I get to the Holy One, the more I recognize the things I didn't even know were there. The more he reveals to me, the more the, the, the dross is brought to the surface and he's able to skim it off, the more I'm able to be purified as pure gold, the more I'm able to be refined by the fire of the refiner. Amen? That's what 21 days of prayer and fasting looks like. It doesn't look like, oh, I'm some rotten sinner and I really need to, I really need to get the grace and mercy of God and I need to, I need to stop eating and I need, to, I need to hurt myself in my physical body, cause myself pain and discomfort so that God will accept me. That's not what this is. The more spiritually mature you are, the more you need this. I'm telling you, this is not just for those people. This is, this is for people who are walking with Jesus who take it real serious because you're not going to go to that next level without prayer and fasting. You're not going to go to that next level in the spirit if you don't first deny the flesh. This is a moment where God is going to open your eyes so that, so that you're not like Hezekiah, pounding your chest, reading your resume, bragging on what a great man or woman of God you are, and in reality, you've got some massive blind spots. God wants to point out those blind spots to us. See, there was a breaking that needed to occur in Hezekiah's heart and life. There was a breaking that needed to happen. He'd, he'd struck down all sorts of idols in the land during his reign as king, and now it was time for the idol in his heart to be dealt with. It was time for the idol that was inside of here that he didn't even know was there to be dealt with. Second Chronicles 32 tells us that Hezekiah had become proud, and he didn't respond appropriately to the kindness and mercy God had shown him. And so we actually do, this tale of Hezekiah is actually told in several different books of the Bible. And so we can cross-reference and we can get different perspectives on this account. And 2 Chronicles 32 shares something with us here that 2 Kings and Isaiah does not. And it is that Hezekiah had become proud, that he did not respond appropriately to the kindness and mercy that God had shown him. And see, what, what Hezekiah had to learn is that when you're going through something, it's not time to bail out. It's not time to burn out. It's time to cry out. Amen. It's not time to bail out. It's not time to burn out. It is time to cry out. When you have failed, when you have messed up, it's not time to run from the throne of grace. It's time to run to the throne of grace. Amen? That's why it takes boldness. It takes boldness. That's why Hebrews 4.16 says, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Why is that a bold move? It's a bold move because you come before a holy God with your unholy mess. You come before him with his perfection and all of your imperfection. On the days when you have to turn your face to the wall like Hezekiah did, those moments where it's, it's so deeply private and so deeply personal that you got to turn your face to the wall because you don't want anybody to see or hear or know what is going on over here. In those moments, I'm telling you, that's when you need to run to the throne of grace, when your face is to the wall. In those moments when you're weeping bitterly like Hezekiah and the, the pain is agonizing, that's not the moment that you run from the throne of grace. That's not the moment that you, like Adam and Eve, go and hide and, and cover yourself, make a covering for your own self. That's a time when you turn to the Lord and say, I need your covering. I need your blood fresh upon my life. I need your mercy poured out fresh upon me today. I'm telling you that God has a special grace for you when you cry out to him. There's a special grace when you're going through that, that time of agony, when your face is to the wall, there's a special grace for you when you cry out to him. That grace is not found when you bail out. That grace is not found when you burn out. That grace is only found when you cry out. That's where it is. Hezekiah had to learn that it wasn't just those people. It wasn't just those idol worshipers who needed to humble themselves. Christian, can I tell you that we can fall into a dangerous trap 
when we think that, oh, it's all those people who need to humble themselves. Can I tell you that the formula for revival in our nation is that we would humble ourselves. And if every person would own that phrase, that I need to humble myself, and we took care of business in our own heart and in our own life, if we let revival start with me, then revival's gonna hit my household. If we let revival start in our household, then revival's gonna hit our church. And if we let revival hit our church, revival's gonna hit our community. But it has to start by humbling myself, not pointing the finger and saying, all those idolaters out there, all those pagans, all that whole secular world, they need to humble themselves. Maybe you need to humble yourself. Maybe like Hezekiah, you're pounding your chest a little too much. See, he, he got to the place where he realized that he needed to cry out to God, and he found that special grace waiting for him. The reason Hebrews says that we can come boldly is that the grace of God isn't given when you deserve it most. It's given when you need it most. It's not given when it's most deserved. It's given when it's most needed, friend. And that's good news for you and me today. We need to have a proper understanding of the grace of God. It, it is not just for the holy people. It is not just for the, for the people who, who follow all the rules, who, who keep the law. Grace is given for people who understand, I'm a lawbreaker. Grace is given for people who understand, I have messed up royally. Maybe today you find yourself in that place. Maybe, maybe this week, maybe yesterday, or maybe even as you look back at 2022 and you go, I am nowhere near the place that I had hoped that I would be as I started out this new year. And you look back with regret. You look back and say, I royally messed up. I'm telling you the grace of God is made for you because it's given when it's most needed, not when it's most deserved. We come before a holy God in an unholy state. That's a bold move. And God says, I want you to make that kind of a bold move. I invite you to make that kind of a bold move. But listen, the enemy, he's going to lie to you. You've got to, to be wise to his schemes, right? Wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. You've got to be clever to the schemes of the enemy who is going to come in and he's going to whisper lies to you. That's why you need to be in the word of God, amen? In 21 days of prayer and fasting, I hope you're turning to the word of God. Because you need that fresh in your heart and fresh in your mind every single day as you start out your day. Because you better believe the enemy has a, he's got a devotional prepared for you. Hear me. He's writing his own devotionals. And he's going to make sure that you get that devotional. He's going to make sure you get that lie. He's going to get you that word. And he's hoping that you're not going to get in any other kind of word. So this is the only word you're going to have. If you base your day off of that word, I'm telling you, it's headed for death and destruction despair. It's headed for depression. You're going to fail. But when you prioritize the word of God, I'm telling you what, the Holy Spirit has a way, doesn't he, of giving you just the word that you need for that day. Because he already knows the schemes of the enemy. He already knows the devotional that the devil has prepared for your life. Because he's got plans for your 2023. He's got plans for your Monday tomorrow. But the Lord already knows what they are, and he's got a word to counteract that. He's already got it prepared. And if you get into the word of God and you just say, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, speak to me, he's going to give you a word for that day. And you're not going to fall for the schemes, the lies of the enemy. You're going to build your life on truth. So the word of the Lord that was delivered to Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah, can I tell you that it was actually an evidence of God's goodness? It didn't feel like that to Hezekiah maybe at the moment, but I say that because for all of us, our days are numbered here on this earth, aren't they? For all of us, our days are numbered. Yet none of us knows just what that number is. But here Hezekiah was given advance warning from the Lord to set his affairs in order, to set his household in order, to make the necessary arrangements while he was yet alive. And that's a courtesy that most of us are never going to receive. But Hezekiah did. This is an evidence of the goodness of God, that he would get that kind of courtesy. Now, let me ask you, if you were to be given just days to live, not from doctors, but from God himself, how would that change the way you live? If you were given just days to live from God himself, and he told you how many days are left in your life, how would that affect the way you live? The psalmist prayed, teach us the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Are you numbering your days? Are, are you living them out wisely? See, Hezekiah may have thought that he had been, 
But when this word came to him through the prophet Isaiah, I bet Hezekiah did some reevaluating of his life. I bet that he, he had to sit back and say, okay, God's not a liar, so if that's true, what changes do I need to make? And so, uh, as we read, Hezekiah cried out to God in prayer, and then in verse 4, but before Isaiah had left the middle courtyard, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. Can I just tell you, that's something somebody should write down. I don't know who that's for, but somebody ought to write that down. Somebody ought to put that on their mirror in the bathroom. Somebody ought to put that on the refrigerator. That word right there is for somebody here today. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. And then it follows up with this. I will heal you. And three days from now, you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. God heard from heaven. God responded to his prayer. And the story of Hezekiah teaches us several things. Firstly, that God can use bad days and bring advantages from our adversity. If you're you're taking notes, that was our first point, that God can use bad days and bring advantages from our adversity. The second point was this, that God gives grace to undeserving, the undeserving, like you and me, purely because of his goodness. His grace is not a product of your earning, your striving, your living. His grace is a product of his goodness. That and that alone. And here's the third point that we see here, that prayers and tears move the heart of God. Prayers and tears move the heart of God. James tells us that the fervent and effectual prayers of the righteous availeth much. Prayers prayed from a place of passion are persuasive. Now, I know that doesn't fit with some people's theology. I know that some people would preach Hezekiah, and here's what they would say. They would say, Hezekiah's prayers didn't change anything. Prayer just changed Hezekiah. And make no mistake, prayer will change you. 21 days of prayer and fasting will change you. But as I read the New Testament, I see story after story after story of Jesus setting out from one place to go to another, and then all of a sudden, somebody shows up out of nowhere and tugs on the hem of his garment. Come on, somebody. All of a sudden, somebody appears out of nowhere and interrupts his path and gets his attention. And it says Jesus was going to go there, but then all of a sudden this happened and it caught Jesus' attention and prayers and tears move his heart. I'm telling you, I'm telling you that it's not just because of Hezekiah, it's not just because of this story, and it's not just some Old Testament formula. I'm telling you, in the New Testament covenant of grace, we serve a God who is moved by prayers and who is moved by tears. He allows us to interrupt his path, to interrupt his plans. That doesn't speak to him being wishy-washy and changing his mind. You know what it speaks to? It speaks to him being a compassionate God that he steps into our situation, into our heartache, into our pain, and he says, your tears aren't wasted. Your prayers aren't wasted. They don't fall on deaf ears. My hand is not too short. My heart is not too hard. I will still move in your situation. I will still bring deliverance and healing. I will answer your prayers. That's the kind of God that we serve today. If you would just grab a hold of his heart, grab a hold of his heart, Quit trying to make a formula. There's too many people walking around with theological formulas, and they haven't grabbed a hold of his heart to understand that he's the kind of God whose heart is moved by prayers and tears. See, the Bible goes on to tell us something pretty incredible happened here with Hezekiah, that God would actually add 15 years to Hezekiah's life as a result of his prayers and his tears that God would actually cause the earth to turn backwards as a sign to him. That on the, on the sundial, on the steps there, instead of the shadow coming one way, it went the other way. And the prophet Isaiah actually asked Hezekiah, how do you want this sign to be given? And Hezekiah said, yeah, do the really, really tough one. Do the one that, that's just impossible. I want to see that. And lo and behold, God, God did that. God turned the earth backwards for Hezekiah. I don't know how that works. I don't know how that happens, but I know it's in God's word and his word does not return void. But here's the thing. 
if God would turn the earth backwards and add 15 years to Hezekiah's life because of his prayers and his tears, what might God do through you, through your prayers, through your tears over the next 21 days? What might happen? What might God have in store for you? I'm not suggesting he's going to turn the earth backwards. Hear me but I believe that God wants to do something miraculous and incredible in your life. I believe, I believe this is from the Holy Spirit. I believe there are some people here today, there's something in your mind and in your heart that you have said is impossible for God. And God says, I'm gonna show you what's really possible as you pray and as you cry out. Just like I showed Hezekiah what was possible. I am the God of the impossible. So what's the thing that you've said, God can't do that. That's never gonna happen for me. And some of you, it's not even that you've said he doesn't have the power to do it. You've said that I don't matter enough for him to do it. His grace isn't given for the deserving. His grace is given for the needy. The needy. He prayed. He cried out to God. So again, today we're starting 21 days of prayer and fasting as we do to begin every year as a church. And so I'd like to pose just three questions for you to ponder as we prepare to close in a time of prayer and worship this morning. The first question is this, what negative situation in your life might God want to turn around for your good and his glory in 2023? The second question, what in your heart and life is in need of God's grace today? Those turn your face to the wall moments, those moments that nobody else knows about, you never want anyone else to see or hear in those turn your face to the wall moments, those agonizing moments of your life. What is it that you need God's grace for in your life today? And thirdly, what might be possible as you cry out to God in prayer over these next 21 days? I realize fasting is not fun. Denying your flesh is not pleasant. And it can produce some really painful moments. But God's word teaches us to fast and pray as a, as a means of spiritual restart. You're not going to get a restart if you just go into this new year casually, lackadaisically, without being very deliberate, very intentional about putting God first. This, this is a means of spiritual restart. Why? Because it positions you to hear more clearly from God. It silences other voices, and it helps the ears of your spirit to be more attuned to God, to hear him more clearly. It destroys the idol of self-dependency, that it's not about my own efforts, I'm going to starve the idol of self-dependency, and it frees your heart from bondage, and it leads you to breakthrough. Maybe today you came into this place, and you have not really given a whole lot of prayer or thought to what you're going to fast. Well, in a moment, we're going to carve out some time for you to seek the Lord. Because, listen, I don't want you to just follow a formula, say, well, what's pastor fasting? I'm going to fast for what he I'm going to fast what pastor fasts. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to ask, what's my spouse doing? What's my parents doing? What's my person sitting next to me doing? What are they fasting? I'm going to fast what they're... No, I want you to be led by the Spirit of God. I want you to go to him and ask him, Lord, what do you want me to give up over these next 21 days? What do you want this fast to look like for me in my life? Because he's a God of the individual. He cares about every single person. He cares as much about you as he did about Hezekiah. He is no respecter of persons, and he has a very specific fast for you over these next 21 days. He wants to do something powerful in your life. It's in the deep places of our pain. It's in the deep places of passionate prayer that God does his best work in our lives. Will you go deep with God over the next three weeks? Will you lay your heart bare? Will you take those face-to-the-wall moments to him, those agonizing moments? Will you take that to him? Will you go deep in the things of God? That's the place where he does his best work. And he wants to draw you into deeper relationship because, hear me, he wants to give you a glimpse of his goodness. He wants you to discover that he is good every moment of every day, not just when things are going well for you. He wants you to discover that even when things are painful, even when things are tough, he is still good. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. Hunger and thirst. Sometimes we act like God is just, God's just sovereign. If he wants to fill me, he'll fill me. No, he's waiting for you to lift your hunger to him. You play a part in this. You are a container, and if you're filled up on a whole bunch of other stuff, he's going to say, there ain't no room for me to pour myself in there. You've got to empty that thing. There needs to be less of you so there can be more of him. 
He, he's not withholding. He wants to pour it out. He wants to pour out his love, his mercy, his presence, his grace in your life. The only question is, are you going to make room for him, for the more that he wants to bring in your life? We've got to starve the flesh and feed the spirit if we're going to get a restart, if we're going to lay the foundation of our own turnaround story. That's what 23 is representing, I believe. There is a turnaround that God wants to bring to your life. That's why we're doing this series, because I believe that's the word that God has given me for your life. It is restart, it is turnaround for 2023. And some of you, again, I'd write that down. I would, I would, man, I would brand that on my forehead. <laughs> restart, you know, uh, turnaround. God wants to do that in your life. And you've got to get that deep down in your heart that you are resolute, that God is the God of restart, that God is the God of turnaround, and that he will do that for me, just like he's done it for so many others. And so Hezekiah, he would later write a song of praise to the Lord that's recorded in the book of Isaiah after his unique experience with the Lord. And here's just a couple of lines from it. Isaiah 38, verses 16 and 17. Lord, your discipline is good, for it leads to life and health. You restore my health and allow me to live. Yes, this anguish was good for me, for you have rescued me from death and forgiven all my sins. Hezekiah was able to look back on that moment. See, I didn't like it when it was happening. It didn't feel pleasant while I was enduring it, but I can now look back on that and say the discipline of the Lord was good for me. I can look back and see his goodness that that even when he warned me of my impending death, He was being good to me. And then the cherry on top, when I cried out to him, when I poured my tears out at his feet, he moved on my behalf. I didn't deserve it, but God is so good. So he wrote a song about it. And after I read that during my time of sermon preparation this week, I was in my office and I I literally, I just shut my computer I just read this text in Isaiah, shut my computer. It was time for me to get home for family dinner and I didn't want to be late. And then the Holy Spirit just pricked my heart. He spoke to me right there. He gave me this image of a tombstone with these words inscribed. 2023 is the year that blank went to die. It was that passage of the the text that we read where it says, you have rescued me from death. I believe God has some rescue. I believe there's some things that that God wants to, of course, bring life and bring restart and bring turnaround, but I believe there's also some things that need to die if if resurrection is going to be possible. Amen? We, We serve a risen Savior. He wants to rise up in your situation. He wants to rise up in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your household. He wants to rise up in your finances. He wants to rise up in your spirit, but I'm telling you today, there's some things that need to die. There's some things that need to go into the grave and that at the end of 23, you're going to be able to look back and say, 2023 was the year that went to die. And I don't know what goes in your blank. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about what goes in that blank. For some of you, it might be a specific area of sin that you've struggled with for years and you thought, I'm never going to walk in victory in that. I'm never going to kick that habit. I'm never going to overcome that sin and temptation in my life. I believe these next 21 days are going to be pivotal to be able to fill in that blank with that sin. 2023 was the year that sin went to die, and it's never going to raise again. Never. I believe that for some people here. For others, it might be things like hopelessness. 2023 was the year that hopelessness went to die. It was the year that fear went to die. Anxiety went to die. Insecurity went to die. I'm done going to other sources for my security. It died. It's gone. It's no longer a part of my identity. The new has come. The old, it's gone. So I don't know what stronghold in your life needs defeated today, but can I tell you what the beautiful thing is as you stand to your feet all across this place? Here's the beautiful thing. I can't tell you what goes in that blank except this. God is going to show up in your blank. I believe the Holy Spirit spoke that to my heart for some people here today, that God wants to show up in your blank. Whatever that area is, he wants to defeat that thing. He wants to defeat it. He wants to bring it down once and for all, for it never to raise its head against you again. That serpent is under 
is under the feet of our God. And he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't get to threaten you one moment longer. And so I'm gonna ask you if you would just to bow your heads and close your eyes. I believe God wants to speak very clearly over these next few moments. We're gonna have some extended altar time as we open up these altars. We want to invite you to come, to come and to commit these next 21 days of prayer and fasting to the Lord, to say, Lord, guide me, direct me, speak to me specifically. What goes in my blank? What is it that you want to put to death this year? God, I don't want to just crucify my flesh, but God, I want to see those things, whatever they are in my life, be put to death once and for all. This isn't just starting it out all over again. We're starting another year with another 21. It's not going through the motions. This is going to be a time of prayer and fasting like none other, like none other. This is going to be the year of victory. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for grace. I thank you that you meet us in this place. I thank you that in those turn our face to the wall moments, God, as our hearts are just absolutely broken, God, that those tears, God, that those prayers, they are not wasted as we cry out to you. God, that is where there is a special grace that is found. And so, God, I commit in this place, Lord, for every person under the sound of my voice that this is not going to be a year where we bail out. It is not going to be a year where we burn out. It is going to be a year where we cry out in desperation to you because we know your heart of goodness, because we know that you respond to the prayers and the tears of your people. God, let us treat this next 21 days as holy, as sacred. God, that we would go deeper in the things of God And God, that we would discover your goodness at a level that we never have before. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts in these next few moments as we worship, as we seek your face, oh God. God, draw us into that deeper place. God, that we would look back on this year and say, that was the year that that thing that was meant to destroy me, it got destroyed. It went to die. God, we want the life that you have. God, not just any life, but that fullness of life, that abundance of life that only Christ can give us. God, may we not settle for anything less in Jesus' name.